the yeah. Okay. Oh, welcome to what's the culinary what's, for cool ah people. yes that's right that's what I named the show culinary for cool people welcome all you cool people out there uh, this is culinary for cool people my name is Eli Holland um, we're gonna learn about the mortar and pestle today uh, first I had a show on Thursday. It was the mystery of the ghrelin gremlin. It's on the hormones ghrelin, leptin, um, weight regain, uh, phasic approach to weight loss, all sorts of good stuff. So if you are interested in learning about that, in addition to how to cook awesome food, go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, it is on the YouTubes and our webpage at uh, fitnessforcoolpeople.com. Uh, where, where else do we have it? Twitch. Twitch. Of course, it's on Twitch. Check out our channel there. You can also find us on all sorts of other social media. Uh, Facebook, Fitness for Cool People. Um, Twitter is Fit for Cool People. Uh, Instagram is, uh, Fitness for Cool People as well. Um, yeah. Did I shout Kevin yet? I forgot. No, Do that. Didn't. Okay, uh, the groovy intro music that you've been listening to was made uh, by little Kevin Tran. Young Kevin. I've known him now for, goodness, five years. Uh, met him at a restaurant and then got him hired at another restaurant. Uh, one of which is open and one of which is <laughs> <laughs> long since closed. Not, not because of Kevin, but um, we could blame him if we... Anyway, yeah, anyway, anyway, so, um, did, did I get, is there anything, um, should we, no, you're gonna should we get really into the, to, uh, no, give me. yeah, all right, so we're going to get into the lecture for today, which is, uh, <laughs> uh the mortar, mortar and pestle, uh, right, live. what, it was, is it, yeah, you see, it's on that side, oh, you see, okay, down there, that's then the live feed. Oh, oh, yeah. sweet. You got it. All right. Well, no, but we're getting it. You get it. Well, da, 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 get it. I got it. Now you get it. Thank goodness. Well, it's good we've got a production team. Uh, so, anyway, the... Uh, oh. <laughs> but if I'm here and I'm here, then I can't talk with my hands. Uh, mortar and pestle, the, uh, the, the master paster. The master paster. Uh, so, uh, why, why use a mortar and pestle when, when we have all sorts of, uh, technology, more advanced technology, advanced technology, uh, um, the garlic paste of your dreams and other uses and, um, you know, stuff. So the recipe we're going to be going over is, uh, uh affectionately called it the garlic paste of your dreams. Um, I, I think it's because, um, what, the, the bazaar is coming up and they have their, their pre-fee for, with the chocolate cake <laughs> of your dreams, I think is the reason why. And anyway, um, so let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, so we have a couple really neat videos. These are, uh, black peppercorns, um, we're going to go over in this, uh, the history of the mortar and pestle, uh, why to actually use it in cooking, even though it's really just a crude, blunt, smashy, smashy object, why it has still so much utility, uh, tens of thousands of years later. Uh, we're going to be highlighting, uh, the yellow paste recipe, the garlic paste of your dreams. Um, and how to use it with uh, grilled or roasted smoked meats and the plethora of other uses it has not just culinary by itself as flavoring but how to use it as a base for a few different um, pastes it, it has a lot of really um, not ubiquitous I guess ubiquitous would be the right word it's universal. Yeah, universal, sure. There's a, there's a lot of cultures that uh, spices yeah. this, this it, 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 in with. Yeah, absolutely, especially with the color, too. It's gorgeous. It makes stuff look great. Uh, it's fantastic. So, um, 
uh, get, getting into the, the, the first topic, why using it, cutting versus smashing. So uh, this is a peppercorn with two different, two different tools being used. Um, unable to play video. Hmm. Oh, hell nah. Why do we suppose that is? I don't know. Um, boink. Start presentation. Mm, what in view? Uh, the you new know, wherever. Just click present. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. And try clicking it again. Yeah. Kind of hanging out on the screen for a little boop, while. Boop, boop. All right. Let's see. Freshness. There we go. So that's a knife blade. Full screen. It. Full screen. Okay. Yeah. Oh. The, yeah. Shit. Okay. So we're and wait. We're gonna. So we sheared that part and <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's why don't bring a sharp knife to. Um, let's get out of full screen. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, now with the with the smashy smash. The good old pock. That's rewarding. Right. All that mealy paste. We we're able to crack the outside of the peppercorn pretty easily, <coughs> letting the weight all do all the work. High surface area. Um, it's a it's a plus EV move using a mortar and pestle to smash dry stuff than trying to chop it with your knife. I know it seems silly, but there you go. Do, do, do. Next slide. So, the history of the mortar and pestle. Um, English derivation of the name, both Latin. One moratorium, receptacle for pounding. Uh, that is not um, very creative. Uh, and then pistolum, the, the pounder. So think like a uh, like a piston. Not like the not the like the the Detroit the Detroit pistons there. They're in they're in sal they're in salary cap hell. Uh, if you follow ball sports, uh, you, you you would know the salary cap hell that the, the Detroit pistons You're are. Making it less timeless. Ahead. I, I don't know if, if in my lifetime that the Detroit Pistons are ever going to be able to get back together as a franchise. Uh, uh, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Rodman and, um, um, what's it called? Uh, Lambeer aren't walking through the doors anytime <laughs> <laughs> soon. And if Dennis Rodman or Bill Lambeer do walk through your doors, run. Cause, <laughs> cause you're giving up a serious weight advantage, <laughs> especially with Bill Lambeer. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, other cultures and names and um, flavors and textures of it. So uh, this one that we're highlighting, the uh, Molcajete uh, Mesoamerica, um, made out of basalt, so volcan volcanic rocks. Um, you can see that it's got a very, very coarse sort of texture for it, uh, perfect for grinding up uh, dry spices. Um, this wooden one here is the Suribachi and Surikogi from uh, Japan. Um, they have a larger version with the mallet uh, where they make the uh, moshi with the smashy smash. Uh, down here, um, this is a mortar and pestle from uh, Africa and um, can kind of see the scale of it. So that's a bucket. That is a uh, bone or piece of wood or something like that, probably wood, um, and feet. Uh, there's other pictures where there's about four or five of people in a, a village or area with four or five of those pestles just smashing away. Uh, probably fantastic for doing really good batches. You're up really high. You get to use a lot of gravity. You can have a very big, heavy stick. A um, lot of good mechanical advantage there. And then, of uh, course, uh, Thai, the uh, the pock pock. 
So this one's made out of uh, terracotta with a wooden handle. This is used for making som tom, the green papaya salad, uh, the papaya pock pock. Uh, oh, oh pock pock, how I uh, how I love papaya pock pock. So and and the uh, and the resto while it was uh, while it was down here in L.A. Uh, history and use. So earliest use. 35,000 BCE uh, earliest records and that was from a paper or something that I saw from like the early 90s so there might be better evidence or something like that but upper upper paleolithic precursor I found was interesting is a precursor for the domestication of grains so research had suggested that and and it kind of makes sense um, grains are crappy they're they're Seeds and grains have got, you know, really hard exteriors. They're, they're made for, for perseverance and not to really um, smack the, uh, um, let things get at all the, the, the good stuff in the inside, the grains and the oils and stuff. They're, they're there for the long haul. Um, they, will, they will survive. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense then trying to go after and, and wrangle them into um, domestication if you can't do anything with them. So the mortar and pestle and other grinding tools, uh, uh, they suspect pre, um, predated the uh, domestication of grains themselves. And with the timing is interesting that it's happening, they said at the end of the Paleolithic era. So, so much for um, orthodoxy. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, oldest known writing uh, is on papyrus in Sanskrit, uh, 1550 BCE. Uh, interesting to note, also in Sanskrit, um, uh, first used spice, recorded spice, I believe, was uh, coriander from the same era. So, um, trivia knowledge. You can maybe get yourself some extra points at bar trivia. Uh, not just used for food, but also for medicine and preparing compounds, uh, apothecaries. Uh, it's traditionally in um, porcelain, uh, the Wedgwood design as kind of depicted here with the classic uh, RX description from uh, Latin, which I want to say, I thought I said recipe or the origin of it was, was simply to imbibe um, stuff that you're supposed to put in your body. Uh, anyway, so the uh, porcelain with the wooden handle, the Wedgwood design was made in 1759. Uh, filler and trivia. What's this picture? So this is some bedrock out um, I believe it was east of Sacramento um, Those holes are a bunch of mortars that the indigenous population used for milling uh, their grain so um, really really utilitarian critical um, long used um, fantastic sort of tool uh, other materials besides bedrock uh, and stone again so varieties of stone the um, uh, Mesoamerican was uh, basalt the the Thai one um, that, that we're going to be using in the video is made out of granite um, hard coarse surfaces grinding outer plant walls um, as well as uh, this one right here um, from uh, Lebanon is used for grinding meat for a uh, fried meat dish, uh, kibbeh, I believe uh, I saw, K-I-B-B-E-H. It was um, uh, super dope seeing the pictures of it. I should have showed the pictures of the meat, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's interesting, you know. I, I'm, I'm you know seeing it being used in terms of uh, meat production, though. I believe they said that it's fallen more out of uh, uh, it's less in favor now um, because of electric uh, grinders. And when you're dealing with wet material, the don't have the same sort of considerations. Um, the terracotta or clay for the salads, Thai salads in particular. So the reason why the wooden um, handle with the terracotta bowl or um, for Thai or uh, Laotian cuisine is that you're just trying to like bruise the papaya and the material a little bit. You're not trying to 
pulverize it by by bruising it and breaking up the cell walls and stuff you you uh, create a opportunity for um the the dressing to kind of mix in and marry and and um fuse with the uh fuse with the food if you're wondering about the Oya reference oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you there you go uh good to know thanks uh mr mr square peg for uh, shouting it out, the uh, the oh yeah, <laughs> which uh, what system was that? That was a game. Was that was that, a... that was that uh, Android streaming console that came and went. I, uh, it I had promise. Say like four or five years. Right, ago. right, right. I remember. Wasn't it? Uh, oh wait, no. Was I'm it, thinking. Actually, I'm thinking, thinking of a different. Like one. The, I think the it was, go. This was like a precursor to like the Steam Box and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, I think that, that it was yeah, an Android. Yeah, okay, it was an Android console. Shout to Mr. Square Peg. <laughs> uh, all right. Mm. All this talk about plants it brings me back to um, one of my uh, uh, original loves. So as an undergraduate, most of my education was based in uh, botany and and biology. Um, I don't remember nearly as much of the stuff as I as I used to. I've I've forgotten all the. I used to be able to name all the conifers and stuff in Cal and yeah, I can't. But what we do know is that plants are awesome and they're mostly filled with water. And uh, that's why smashing them helps. So, shearing versus compression. Um, take a look at this model of the cell. I'm not sure um, how much the font is going to show up here, but but that's largely irrelevant. We have the, the nucleus right here. All this light green stuff, uh, cytoplasm, cytosol, it's the, the liquid of the cell, that um, nutrient exchange, moving stuff. Um, <clears throat> in a much more detailed zoom, we'd see like the cytoskeleton and microfibrils and stuff like that. And it's really this wire frame and suspension of cables and stuff like that, holding the cell apart, uh, uh, up and about, allowing uh, proteins to, to move around and packages to be dropped off and stuff like that. Um, the vacuole right here is the fluid filled balloon that helps the cells nice and expand and push on the outside of the cell wall. And, um, by staying, it's called turgor pressure, the, um, vacuole pushing on the outside of the cell wall. And, uh, without it, plants aren't able to do photosynthesis. The, um, when plants wilt, that is a lack of turgor pressure. Uh, in their cells, in the chloroplasts, the thylakoid discs, which are responsible for collecting the light from the sun and doing the light-dependent and light-independent reactions to make sugar, which then gets sent forth throughout all the heterotrophs. Um, they can't do photosynthesis if they're, if they're limp, and, limp, limp and flaccid. So all this water in here, in like garlic or onion, that's where all the sulfides are. That's where all the flavors are. And so if we, you know, think about then that video where I've got this little thin blade trying to go through an individual cell to break it up. Think about mincing garlic. If you go through with the blade and you mince up garlic, you've got all sorts of chunks that have got edges and aren't smashed. And anytime those cells don't get smashed, all the oil and the flavor and stuff is, is trapped in them. Some processes, it doesn't matter necessarily as much. Um, others, uh... It, it does. Um, what else? Uh, when shearing does work, we'll get to that in uh, modern um, uh, modern tools later on. Uh, so compression, however, you're, you're able to squish everything rather than trying to slice through it. Uh, much more effective, uh, especially because you're hitting a much larger surface area with the, uh, with the pestle, as we saw. Uh, and then the other thing is batch size and functionality. So uh, this picture down here, um, we see uh, cumin seeds with much more detail than I was expecting. So that's awesome. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing again in much more detail is, ooh, what's this brown stuff? Coffee grounds. So let's say you're going to use a spice grinder or a spice mill or something like that. Well, Well, that's great. You have to have at least two. Otherwise, your coffee is going to taste like cumin and your cumin is going to taste like what is that (laughs) 
<laughs> Limp and Flats, wouldn't it be in a, uh, with, with the like the Toys R Us space with the uh, an apostrophe for yeah. Limp and Anyway, Limp and, Limp and Flats, it sounds like a, a grindcore band from the late 90s. <laughs> or a hair metal band from oh, the 70s. Or metal, yes, a hair metal band from the 70s. Okay, enough of this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay, so so you have to have two things, and uh, otherwise your stuff tastes like herbs. You don't want garlic coffee. Um, uh, but the other thing is, see how the blade, the lawnmower blade in there, is casting a shadow on those. There is a lot of daylight in there. So when I spin that thing on, it's it's not gonna. There isn't enough volume in there to actually grind the the, the the cumin and actually grab it unless I stand there and and shake. And that's just that's just silly. Um, and it's messy and it's not dope. Uh, we can do better. We can do much better. The mortar and pestle does much better. So all of that I can put in a small two three inch pestle, grind grind, and it's done quick wipe and and the thing that is specifically dedicated for grinding spices and not used for grinding coffee is is clean and it's a texture that I want uh, additionally with the uh, wet material we can get better control um, over the, uh, the the texture and the color so let's say you're trying to um, puree uh, tomatoes for a salsa and when you um, Excuse me. <laughs> this guy. Maybe, maybe one, maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll stop be burping as, on camera. I was gonna say, be as, be as civilized as Dr. James Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Right. Um, <clears throat> batch size and function. Okay. Uh, wet material, better control. So anyway, so when we use a blender, what ends up happening is we'll get a lot of air into the material and I'll take a nice red tomato puree and turn it this pink this obnoxious looking um, pink um, also especially if you're using large batches with, with stuff that's particularly sort of fibrous if it's not a really sharp blade or you're not using a lot of it so you can really brrrr, like like grind grind up a substantial batch with a, a batch Oh, you need to <laughs> a substantial batch. <laughs> what? Just keep going. <laughs> um. Uh. Anyway, it's um. You can break down the fibers a lot more consistently, at least on small, medium-sized batches with the with the mortar and pestle. So let's get it. Modern tools. There will be shearing. So some of these more modern tools, and I'll say modern loosely, given that the Paleolithic era started 3.5 million years ago, and mortar and pestle and stuff was uh, 35,000 years ago. Um, the advent of stone mills and is a is a modern sort of invention. Uh, additionally, we have the electric mill and grinder. So for, for people that work in um, like brewing or baking or something like that, uh, you got a couple grinders that will just burp, smash all the stuff and you can adjust the distance between like the two pins, for example, to get the, the coarseness that you're looking for. Give me a second. What? 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 Let's what? Kill Skype. Kill Skype. Kill Skype. <sighs> Fuck you, Skype. Skype net. <laughs> get to get to the get to the chopper no uh, no hold on to come your butts. come come with me if you want to live i <sighs> who's your daddy and what <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> rotostat rotostat hamad so we'll, we'll we'll talk about the these other ones real fast cryo milling is um these other ones in general are actually had their application first in science and then uh, food people with uh, the molecular gastronomy and modernist cuisine and so forth started using them to push the parameters of what you could really do in terms of uh, uh, texture. Uh, modernist cuisine has some fantastic pictures of it or if you just search for some of these sort of things and look at it in food, um, you'll be able to see and, and kind of 
maybe perhaps appreciate like what exactly they're able to uh, to do with it but cryo milling so um you're you're taking material and you're dropping it in uh liquid nitrogen or in the case of um actual scientific equipment there are these uh all-in-one systems that use energy and coolants and stuff like that to keep the stuff at i think 196 degrees celsius so that's really cold um the cool thing about cryo milling is that once you drop something in liquid nitrogen uh, it is so brittle that you can smash it or cut it or run it through and it's just gonna everything just turns to dust every aspect of it so with like raspberries the little seeds in there dust everything dust then you can use it for garnishing or whatever um, the uh, rotosat homogenizer colloid mills um, Paco jet uh, those actually work with uh, shearing so this is an example of the rotostat um, mechanism uh, the liquid so this rotor spinning 13,000 feet per per minute was um, <clears throat> 150 miles an hour I think is what it comes out to um, so the the fluid comes through up the rotor and then down through this slot by the they call it the statter but this is a very very small uh, uh, gap cells are maybe 50 microns uh, wide and this is a, probably around that sort of tolerance maybe a little bit wider um, and as it lit the the liquid shoots through this very tight area as it gets pushed against the the wall here and the rotor here and it, it's spinning it creates this hydraulic shearing that is um, just just macerating individual cells and uh, with the application with uh, molecular research for example when I was um, working on leukemia uh, we had I used I think an ultrasonic um, a homogenizer to, to break up the cells uh, so that way it could get at the genetic the sweet sweet genetic material and protein um, inside of them to do science um, but now we use it for food and we get everything, not just food, but other uh, uh, anything where anything has to be mixed. So making of paints, uh, it'll break up the pigment finer than, than ever was possible before. Um, any sort of powder, it'll break it up into an even finer powder. Um, and then that's uh, a picture of a rotostat. Uh, and so rotostat homogenizers are uh, sometimes these handheld things versus the colloid mills are uh, these tabletops. The uh, Paco jet was um, this interesting sort of uh, contraption. It's used specifically for the restaurant industry. They come in at, um, I think they're on the second iteration now. I think the ticket on it is uh, 6,500 bucks, but uh, uh, you take like, I don't know, was it like two quarts, something like, like is it something like maybe like two quarts or a quart size like metal carafe fill it with whatever uh liquid you you want it just has to be level it could be pesto it could be soup it could be an ice cream base what, what whatever it is and once it's frozen rock solid uh you put it in this machine and it has a a a, a blade on an axis and it spins at like 10,000 or 15,000 rpm and crazy crazy fast and so uh it goes down through your frozen material because the frozen material is hard kind of like with the cryo milling you get the shear force going at the blade spinning so fast anything you put in there gets turned into a uh, super smooth ice cream uh looked about as smooth as you would get from uh liquid nitrogen um uh, uh ice cream and cryo ice cream uh very very cool um if you just for fun you can take a look at the the videos online for the promotional videos for it they make like super creamy frozen scoopable pesto like they're serving quenelles of it and, and, and stuff it was just you know amazing um uh but yeah sheer rotosat homogenizer oh where are we at <clears throat> do we run out of sauce oh there we go Ah, uh, so yeah, colloid mills, Paco jet, uh, rotoset homogenizers, uh, shearing in the modern era, uh, more effective than the modern, uh, than, than the mortar and pestle, but thousands of dollars, mostly for scientific process, 
Um, if you're a food nut then and you want to mess around with food, awesome. Good stuff. Uh, cryo milling is actually a little bit cheaper because as long as you get a doer or you can put the down payment on a doer, welding shops, you can get liquid nitrogen at welding shops and then do your own cryo milling at home. Um, sweet. So, there's the beast. That is, I think, um, it's an 8 inch mortar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, granite. Uh, Thai style. I want to say I got it from Temple of Thai, but they're they're available. They're around. You can get them. Um, it's heavy. It's good. I'd like to get a slightly smaller one, maybe like a two inch one, a little little pinner one, so that way I can, if it's just a few seeds, to 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 grind it up. This one I got for batching up, um, medium to yeah, de decent sized amounts of paste. Um, certainly enough to definitely like last through a week and we'll, we'll talk about the the batch size with the the recipe when it comes up uh but some general sort of principles with it uh let the weight do the work it's heavy uh uh the, you don't need to put the death grip or the death grip on it and be really trying to muscle it in there let, let let gravity do the work um especially if you're smashing a lot of stuff and you're gonna be pocking out a lot of stuff for for a little while uh it's better to have a slightly loose grip so that way you don't get um a wrist strain um and then let the texture do the work uh that is let the texture of the mortar and pestle do the grinding for you so this isn't nearly as coarse as uh, uh molcajete um, but you can still use it in a circular sort of milling grinding fashion, like a, um, uh, goodness, it was, uh, was it a cornstone? There, there's, um, the mortar and pestle and stone technology comes in a wide variety of flavors. And so there's some that are just these really long, wide, like flat, shallow things. And someone will just take a stone and, you know, work the stone over this large surface area. So you can use this in a similar sort of fashion for, for grinding against the edges. Um, and then other uh, size and smashing um, considerations. So work the batches as uh, we'll go over the video that I did for, for making the paste. You'll see that I probably could have heeded my own advice it, it ends up okay but there'll be a point where as i was doing it and doing the video it's like well this is a teachable moment um also do the dry stuff first so as the dry stuff starts getting saturated and becomes squishy and is less hard then there's less um force that can be uh, built up between the bottom of the mortar the 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 pestle coming down and its um rigid cell walls kind of like a uh, um I know, uh, like a, trying to crush a golf ball. I know golf balls can't get hydrated, but um, if it did, it would just kind of bleh, wouldn't really do anything. Um, it's the coarseness and the coarseness and the, the hard materials and stuff that that, that allows the, the, the grinding to, to work so well. Uh, if you're working with um, fibrous material, so your gingers, your lemongrasses, celery, cilantro, onions, um, stuff that needs to be pounded uh, stuff that has skin on it, uh, you want to slice it um, thin or mince it. Uh, the more uh, mincing and slicing that you do uh, ahead of time, the smaller the fibers will be. And as, as we know with, um, well, maybe you do, uh, with plants, those fibers are there for structural integrity to, to, to keep it standing up straight and not collapsing and stuff. And so they are very, very resistant to a variety of... of, of um, forces and biochemical reactions so by slicing them up as much as possible you then at least give yourself a chance to be able to smash them um, at some point you'll end up getting into just actually smashing the individual bits so so when we see it initially it's just all right i've got this giant i've got this tool and i've got this giant surface area to to, to work with so i can just kind of throw the stuff in there and smash it haphazardly and eventually uh, just by, um, I don't know, random luck or, or, or randomness and, and moving it around and stuff like that, that, that it'll end up getting, uh, mixed homogeneously. And the answer is actually no, you will get to a point where a lot of it'll get broken down, but if you want to break down, get it broken down even finer, you'll have to individually hunt down the small bits and smash, 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 smash. 
and <laughs> you can get trapped in whatever minutia your 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 brain is allowed. If if you're looking for a, a way to practice uh, mindfulness or something like that, you can really get into the Zen of hunting down each and one of those things. Uh, if you've uh, done a variety of stimulants. Um, and you've decided to make this. Well, you'll give yourself hours of entertainment hunting down each and every little bit. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, practically, uh, when especially you see in the video when we get to the dropping the garlic, get, get the get the get each individual little piece of garlic. Um, scrape down the sides to make sure that you continue to incorporate everything, and you don't end up with pockets that might is like. Oh, I thought I got that, and then there's these giant chunks of it everywhere. That's not great. It takes more time. Don't overload uh, the mortar. Um, essentially, work in batches, um, but it, this is to the overall volume. Uh, you can be, even if you're working in batches in iteration, it gets to be a point where there's just too much of it in there so it's okay scoop some out or uh, make sure that you batch accordingly and get through the entire iteration of it you don't want to have um, uneven sort of uh, batches like if you make a recipe that's twice what you can handle and you accidentally threw all the pepper in first and stuff then you're later like trying to eh. oh we need to clean that up that's the third thing that I wanted to the extra quote. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> flying without a net here. Uh, ooh, there it is. Look at that lovely paste. Bright yellow, so you can see it'll stain chicken and and light colored meats, uh, pork and stuff like that, really really well. Um, uh, pollo ensado. Asado inspired recipe. So the yellow Mexican uh, grilled chicken that you'll find at um, the uh, local Hispanic markets um, or in Mexico. Uh, there's it's a paste, so there's variations ab ab abound. I'm sure everybody's um, mother has a slight variation on it, and um, people probably fight over whose mother has the best um, paste. Um, I didn't actually look at any of the, the, the recipes prior. I just kind of did it off a of feel from living in Southern California and eating yellow pollo asado for a handful of years and just kind of knowing what, what goes into Hispanic food. Um, I do have a very good book, um, A Thousand Mexican Recipes by Marge Poor. Uh, she has, a, I, I guess I want to say a more complete sort of version where I use a a couple hacks and we'll talk about that um so a lot of them have uh that, that we saw or maybe it's just because it's the internet maybe it's just the one recipe and everybody copied it and it's like oh yeah no i've got content but um a lot of them had uh mexican oregano uh in it uh ours did not um i would not be opposed with subsequent iterations considering i got some very fresh oregano from my friends mexican oregano from one of my friends gardens that has been dried up so maybe in one of the other iterations i'll give it a go uh vinegar and citrus um also go in there and while i'm not necessarily opposed obviously to using vinegar or citrus with with the food um or with the pastes um in general um i do not like marinating my meat in citrus or vinegar for anything longer than um an hour for a twofold reason one uh, especially with chicken uh, acids for a long time start essentially doing work on it like it's ceviche uh, we don't want ceviche chicken i want the grill to cook my meat not not the citrus so it kind of gives it like a mealy mushy kind of texture on on the outside and the other thing is um i found that by sitting stuff in acidic uh marinades for uh far too long um they get really really acidic and also kind of dry on the outside and um ch chalky is that yeah I, I get chalky like um like overcooked kind of fish chalky and flaky 
not uh not, not good it's it's not what we're looking for with like a, a, a chicken breast we want something that that's moist and tender and uh juicy and just has a flavor on on the outside that's the other thing pastes and marinades don't penetrate into the inside of the meat it is only a surface treatment and it only penetrates as much as maybe three milliliter or milliliters millimeters uh, it's, it's the metric so it's the same thing but um there's this uh uh there's this this uh uh fallacy that 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 pervade that that per pervades for forever that marinades and spice rubs and stuff like that penetrate deep oh oh so deep uh, and no they, they they don't they're just superficial they're just superficial treatments um the only thing that can really uh uh dissolve into the meat is is salt and we know that by um the vast amount of products that we have from salted meat so brining meats cured meats your hams your salamis all sorts of stuff like that um I believe sugar also also penetrates, um, but uh, all those oils and, and stuff like that, those are giant large molecules that, that, that can't penetrate through the cell membranes and, and um, don't, uh, don't dissolve into to solution uh, like salt does, and it can just passively diffuse throughout the, the rest of the meat. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, and most definitely will be um, uh, a post, because uh, salting and brining uh, meat uh, pre-production is one of the things that like using the mortar and pestle will take your food to the next level All right. um, we use turmeric instead of achiote so um, achiote or annatto seeds um, that's uh, some of it is a Spanish um, element I know with the uh, Spanish food they'll use like with the paella they, they prefer saffron but um, achiote as a yellow coloring or natto has been used for a, a good long while if you get uh, cheddar for example the yellow cheddar the coloring in if it is uh, a natto oil um, I made some for uh, the Filipino dish uh, the natto oil uh, chicken inasol it's uh, very tasty um, I'm not sure how much I can actually taste taste achiote. Uh, it's a colorful sort of thing. It's very neutral and earthy, almost in the same way like a non-smoked like paprika. Um, turmeric, however, um, and I mean the dried stuff, not not the fresh. So when you find it fresh, if you go to um, like Indian Middle Eastern or some Southeast Asian markets and stuff, the little thumb-sized uh, knobs kind of look like ginger they're orange um like a carrot uh not that we we want the the ground turmeric powder um that is completely devoid of anti antioxidants or nutrition or any sort of magic that people say oh have turmeric it's great it'll uh it's good for what ails you no it's not and the stuff that's been sitting dried has like no antioxidants on it and if you saw the ghrelin and leptin lecture that i did earlier this week i had a mm, kind of okay rant on antioxidants and um foreshadowing for uh foreshadowing for another lecture um let's see uh, other highlights of this dish. So I like it too because it has a salvage product, uh, the cilantro stem. So you don't have to use the leaves. You can use the leaves for garnishy sort of stuff uh, or eaten, uh, putting on top of tacos and, and things like that. The stems themselves, which, you know, we're probably only going to end up in soup stock anyway, you can smash, smash, smash and use them for paste. The stems are loaded with the, the oils from cilantro. Um, and it's those stems that actually lend itself towards um uh, towards the thai curries as the uh cilantro roots for uh thai curry is a quintessential product and it's different than using the cilantro um, um ah uh using cilantro root versus cilantro stem would be similar to using celery root versus celery stems or stalks the things that we eat if that analogy makes sense uh low salt so um some people have issues with uh, uh salt and their ability to process salt or maybe they've got kidney problems or, or something like that um 
Uh, their doctor said, oh, you can't have a lot of salt. That's great. This doesn't have a lot of salt uh, in it as all, at all. Um, part of that is by design because I'm brining my meats ahead of time, and so I don't need the salt to be in the paste exclusively. The salt has already been in, in well spread out through the meat. This garlic paste is just going on the outside with a little bit of salt that's in it to... Um, a little bit of flavor on, on the outside, but then let the, the, the rest of the, the meaty taste of the, the, the chicken or pork or whatever it is that cook be highlighted by the salt on the inside. Um, uh, this recipe also has a really good yield. Uh, I think when we actually made the batch, it was 108, 110, something like that, I think is what it pops up, but it, it, it's, it's usually about 120 grams. Um, and the pork loin recipe that, that we did, uh, with that surface area, we used about 40 grams um, of, wow, how did that work out? So we used about 40 grams on the, the, uh, the meat itself, and, um, um, the entire yield, the whole 120 grams, will get you about 15 to 30 servings of 40 gram increments of, of protein. So if you count your macros, um, and you know about muscle protein synthesis, how, like, it's a good idea to eat between 20 to 40 grams of uh, protein at, at every meal. So if that's, you know, kind of the universal target for, for health or strength training and stuff like that, uh, this recipe that we're making will give you like 15 to 30 of those iterations, depending upon the surface area of the meat that you're using. So the pork loin has a pretty good surface to volume ratio. If you're using chicken where it's a bunch of smaller, thinner, um, sort of breast, uh, it might not go nearly as uh, long. Um, but it is versatile with any um, with any protein. Uh, fish, chicken, uh, lamb, um, beef, pork. Uh, but um, what were the, what were the sections from the the last one? No. No, no veal, no and, veal and no, no tiger and no dicks. Tiger dicks. Um, I'm sure it probably works well on both veal and tiger dicks, but, um, don't do it. <laughs> no, wait, no, those are, those are the dietary restrictions I have in order to lose weight. No, I, <laughs> oh, it's great. That was my problem. I was just eating all so much veal and tiger dick that I was going over my calories for the day. Yeah. Said you gotta go lean and eat gorilla steaks. Uh, yes, eat gorilla steaks. They're more endangered, <laughs> earlier, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, recipe. Uh, so this will be posted. Um, I will put it in a better font. I'm I'm a sucker for this font, but I understand the re readability is kind of doo doo at times. Uh, so a couple things to, to to highlight with this. So. Um, we have it in two ways. One, by weight, which is more precise and more preferred and lends itself, especially if you're counting macronutrients and counting your calories to do everything by weight to be much more accurate than doing things volumetrically or by eyeball. As it is, if you're counting macronutrients or calories, uh, we already have a tendency to under-report and then trying to eyeball something or using a volumetric uh, measurement, um, I'll definitely highlight in another food lecture for sure. Uh, when you're dealing with baking, um, they do everything by weight period, full stop. They even weigh water, because if, if you don't weigh everything, then your measurements are going to be way, way off. For this flavor paste, eh, it doesn't really matter, but I like bringing this amount of precision to all of my cooking and all of my food and stuff like that, because it transitions really well to um, managing health and weighing things and just being in the habit of, of knowing what you're eating and where you're at calorically and, and macronutrients. So, um, that out of the way, we'll break it down. There really isn't that much to it. Um, there's been more talking than there's been um, ingredients. Uh, the cilantro stems, minced. Garlic cloves, whole. Onions, minced. Turmeric powder. The salt. Uh, it could be large grain salt. Um, I don't think it matters. Uh, here we use large grain salt. I kind of like the idea because it's a little bit more coarse and so we'll initially be able to help break up a few more of the fibers, but at the same point, once it's added, it's there's so much liquid in there that I'm pretty sure it dissolves pretty quickly. Uh, whole black peppercorns, cumin seeds whole, 
now this measurement in particular so some three gram measurements some half gram measurements we also have it here if you don't have the scales you can do it uh, volumetrically and eyeball it um, cat sounds um, it says grind or smash so if you don't have a mortar and pestle but you still want to use the recipe uh, you can try and you can use you can use uh, black pepper. Yes, okay, thank you. This is this is not thank. You. I mean, yes, thank you for watching. But no, I was uh, I was reminded of uh, uh, something just talking about it. So um, well, thank you, Eli. Well, you're quite welcome, Eli. <laughs> we need sleep, otherwise we talk to ourselves. And then he takes a drink. Drinks. <laughs> After this, I'm gonna go mash away. I think on that um, on the Super Nintendo with the uh, with oh, the yeah. with some some good old Street Fighter Two hyper fighting. Yeah. So, twenty years, and I finally started to learn how to understand how to play Street Fighter Two. <laughs> uh, next, uh, next, maybe I'll get that skateboard going again and, and learn how to learn how to ollie like I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> and die um anyway so the uh um there's a real uh a real big difference between using pre-ground um herbs and spices versus grinding them fresh so um all the oils in um herbs and spices are very very volatile uh, they evaporate very quickly based upon normal room temperatures. Uh, oxidation just throws real heavy body blows at it and uh, oxygen just obliterates all the, the tasty flavor molecules in it. That's what I was talking about with the, the turmeric powder just sitting on the shelf getting just hammered by light and heat and oxygen. And so when you get something that's on a shelf you really have no idea how long it's been sitting there ground on the shelf and then you have no idea how long it's been sitting in the warehouse and what I could only assume would be Riverside for God knows how long. Okay, if not Riverside then somewhere in the uh, in Inland Empire. Not or... everyone's in LA. But everybody has the internet, so they can look it up. Okay, wherever you folks live, uh, 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 think of the most godforsaken place near in, in mind's eye that is hot and there's a warehouse and stuff is being stored. And then imagine that your black pepper that you're about to put in your food to try and make flavorful has been sitting there for two or three years. All of the wonderful oils and stuff are going to be gone. And it doesn't have the same sort of character. And if you moderately care about culinary in any meaningful way, then it's important to you. If you, you know, if you if you don't, and you're not some nerd like me about it, then it doesn't then it doesn't matter. Um, but to really get the best flavor out of it, grind everything uh, grind everything fresh uh, as needed, and that's what the mortar and pestle really brings to bear. Especially if it's just a small batch, you can grind everything up. Grind uh, it in your teeth and spit it on the meat. Yes, you can grind it like like chicha. <laughs> exactly. Since we're using a Mexican space, you can you can. Uh, uh, what's the likelihood that your teeth are gonna fare as well as that granite? I mean, sure, they're made out of calcium carbonate, but that granite that's made out of silicates and oxides and stuff. And also, it doesn't have nerves. Also, it doesn't have <laughs> nerves. Well, yeah, um, I don't think the outer dentin has nerves, and if you're chewing, and anyway, 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 we're we're tired and rambly, and we we gotta we gotta move it along, I guess. Mies, short for mies and plus, it's fancy, it's French. Uh, mies and plus, uh, everything in its place. It's the little bowls with the organization. So. Um, Unless you're super awesome and you've made the recipe a bunch of times and you can start the process in mid-swing and have your timing down so it's like, oh, I know I've got at least 30 minutes before I have to all of this other stuff going. I'm going to throw the meat. That's great. Everybody else, and especially if you're working in a restaurant or whatever, mise en place. You look at the recipe. You get all your bowls set up, weighed out with everything that you need. 
put everything away, break it down, stay nice and clean, and then look at this. You've just got this nice, small, little footprint in your kitchen, uh, either at home or in the work area. Uh, um, so that way you're not throwing elbows and, and uh, having people yell at you, and um, everything is fast and organized. Uh, so there's the onion, the turmeric powder, the salt, the garlic, whole black peppercorns, whole cumin seeds, whole cilantro, all this stuff is readily available. Um, I, I mean, regional notwithstanding, like, m most people can get access to onions and garlic. Powdered turmeric could either be purchased on the internet or it's probably just sitting there. Um, especially your uh, uh, Indian, uh, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, uh, Hispanic um, uh, markets, those, those will have turmeric for sure. Um, and you want to go there anyway because... Uh, um, going to um, uh, Safeway, Albertsons, Ralph's, um, what, what are some other ones? Uh, uh, major, major supermarkets that aren't um, either geared towards marginalized populations or ethnic populations. Uh, the the, the fruit, fruit and vegetable prices are just super, super gouge. Um, so, uh, but readily available. Um recipe so uh a little bit of pre-prep work and i kind of want to show off some some knife skills um oh we didn't have the the blooper real oh i've got <laughs> sweet <laughs> awesome uh, no, actually there's a different blooper oh oh yeah <laughs> okay great great so this will be this will be a surprise for 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 all of us um anyway so just just a couple um for for mincing onions Woo! And that's how you don't. Uh, yeah, I can't get that last one. That's how you don't cry when you cut onions. You just have to cut them really, really fast. Um, the let's see if I can get to. So let's blow this up a little bit and just kind of show off. So those are the edge of my. Can they? They can't. Can they? Yeah, they can. Okay, so that's just like the edge of my knuckles right there that the knife is going up and down. And as I'm curling my fingers back, that's what's getting the thickness or thinness of it. Um, the claw. Bam, 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 bam. That's fast. Those are thin. You need a sharp knife. And um, and practice. Uh, once the... Uh, but the, the, the claw and a sharp knife is what you need in order to be able to, to, to cut things. And once you learn how to cut things, then cooking is just, it becomes so much easier. Uh, well, knife skills at some point, yeah. Yeah, and intermittently uh, throughout the um, existence of this program. Uh, the mints, so once they're sliced up into those rings, you can get through, get a nice stack, and, and get a mince. It doesn't have to be the best mince since we're going to pack it, uh, or pocket. Um, I want to see if I can show off some of the fibers in here, but I think it's a little difficult. Nah, it's the striations right there, striations right there, very, very faint. There's one right there. Those are the, those are those fibers that you gotta that you got to cut through so that way um, you don't have these giant long fibers uh, in your in your paste. Then the cilantro and so that's a stem so that's all fiber. I mean technically onions are stems. They're bulbs. A bulb is an underground stem. You can tell that it's a stem because it's photosynthetic. Its roots are not photosynthetic. Um, the other thing with this cilantro, um, so we'll pause and as the, uh, front of the cilantro starts getting wider and wider, as my hand is moving farther and farther away from it to pinch it together, we, we have to take time to, to readjust our hand and, and, and regroup. So spread, and then we can see a nice boop pinch. So we have a nice good clump where it can uh, have some sort of backbone for it to, to work off of. And then the stems kind of get a crazy and now we get a long one and stuff like that in there. And that's not quite with a mouse. Great. 
point with the mouse. Don't use your fingers. They're not actually watching <laughs> you in real life, you jerk. <laughs> uh, what that that scene from um uh 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 Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, when Morgan Freeman hands Kevin Costner the um the 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 magnifying the uh yeah. the, and and he, and he he's looking he's like, oh and they start pointing with the sword like no 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 you dumbass they're they're off in the dis- distance and what does he say like how you folks conquered us i have no idea or something <laughs> along those lines <laughs> you nah, just a bunch of goofballs okay um so this is a 10 minute video and oh we're gonna mute that you don't want none of this uh, 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 take that, uh, uh, uh. We're gonna mute that because you don't want to hear it pock for ten hours. But so this is a, the the cumin seeds in here, uh, first, and we're using the circular sort of milling and grinding, and we'll use some of the smashing. Uh, I'm gonna kind of let it run. If um, did you actually want audio playing for those videos? I just had it on the mic for you. No, none none of them needed okay. any sort of audio. Okay. I mean, the, let me know, but... the the onion one and the cilantro one would have been okay just to hear the, you know, but. Whatevs. The the um the, the one with the pork loin, for example, for short. Uh so we're just milling away and um I added the pepper now and again all the dry components in there first so we can really, really, really pulverize them, get them nice and fine. At the same point though, uh we have control where we want a coarser sort of um uh texture we can get it. If I was processing larger, larger batches of just dry material, uh, I would use a food processor and pulse it. Um, but this is smaller and um, I can get it finer and I don't need to get a large uh, electric contraption. Next is the cilantro stems. Um, because they're fairly fibrous, um, I want to really, again, master it. Do we want to expand it? Yeah, let's it. Uh, this way they can kind of see this yeah, stuff here. Right. It's fine. I mean, it's... Blah, blah, blah. It's not like it, it, expanding it isn't going to zoom it in. I don't... Is it... Eh, eh. Yeah. Um, so we smash the dry stuff first. Next, we're smashing the tough and important stuff. The cilantro. Now, so you can see how my hand is slowly starting to kind of slide up it. I started with the death grip. I was really holding on to it, and, and I could feel the hand and tension, stuff like that. Go a little bit looser, and we're letting the pock do the work. Smashy, smashy. Um, with regards to working the small batches, so right now it's definitely a nice, small, manageable sort of batch. Um, and so that's why I'm able to add everything at once. Uh, it's a little bit dry. We scrape down the sides and we're starting to incorporate it. Um, at this point, I might be trying to hunt down little individual bits of uh, cilantro or um, uh, un- uh, any of the unground um, spice materials. Uh, now the onion. Ooh, that right there. Oh, and then to cut, and then he goes back for the rest of it like a chump. So, work in small batches. Uh, fail right there look at all that nonsense now i'll expand it just for a minute look at all that nonsense up there it's all up on the sides it's not in the kill zone right there and we can see the stuff slowly but surely getting pulverized and smashed away uh the parenchyma cells the 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 pithy sort of squishy cells with um onions that are just filled with sugar and water and all the the flavor and stuff like that those just blast away and and, and turn to water and 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 nothing but it's a it's again the structural fibers that are holding it together so now we're starting to scrape it down if i had the onions to do back uh differently i would have done it in um two passes uh to get it uh even um finer um this is just me nitpicking, but um, I think it's perfect. Or per, per, wait, it's not perfect, but it should have been. Um, we're definitely scraping down all the smashy little bits. Uh, as, as people get more and more proficient with the mortar and pestle and or um, 
the uh, technique calls for it with the, the food that you're trying to cook, uh, you'll get a long spoon um, like this. So uh, with the with the sumtum, the, the papaya salad, uh, the person will be with the mortar with the right hand and the spoon in the left hand tossing the uh, salad dressing in and the, tossing the papaya salad around at the, at the same time. Um, I don't feel that we are really getting into it there. <laughs> yeah. Holy hell, we're only at the five minute mark. Okay, so... It's a ten minute pock. It is a ten minute pock. So, that's the blessing and the curse, is that on one hand, this only this really only takes ten minutes, and you get um, what did I say, thirty, forty gram uh, servings of meat, uh, uh, forty gram protein servings of meat. So thirty divided by, I don't know, we eat four times a day, mm -hmm. four times a day. So that's uh, seven days, a little bit more than seven days. Uh, if you have the whatever meat that you're gonna serve with this um, is your every meal and more likely than not you'll have a breakfasty thing and um, a lunchy thing so in 10 minutes you might make okay now we're at the garlic so see individual garlic smash 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 hunt down individual pieces put it right in the kill zone and smash them up uh, you could have the garlic lengthwise to break up the fibers if you want, but I don't really think that they're that big a deal. And um, we'll see with the uh, the pork loin that we end up putting it on later on uh, that it adds a nice um, visual appeal because the... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that one I felt was particularly re rewarding. Uh. <laughs> Get some. Get some. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, a very male house. Uh, 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 take that, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so really hunting down those things. Because if you put them all in there and you smack it, uh, they're rubbery and they're slick on the outside. They just kind of bounce everywhere and you can overload it really quickly. Uh, it's not great. Um... And so we'll get to scraping and, and, and incorporating, and we're, we're basically, you know, we're done, like, once the, the gut, but um, I got sidetracked. Ten minutes to get, uh, what do we say, seven days, if you were just eating all the meat that you made with this paste, but uh, maybe you'll have a protein shake, and then maybe you'll have, like, some regular breakfasty kind of foods with, like, eggs and stuff like that, so um, this paste could last two, three weeks with normal use. Uh, I mean, if you've got fam and you got a lot of heads to feed and stuff, then it'll go a little bit faster. But for a single person, two, three weeks, um, freeze it off in little portions. You could uh, wrap it. Uh, ooh, you could take yourself a um, ice cube tray, line it with individual pieces of saran wrap, uh, wrap it up in there, and then put the thing in a bag, and then you got little chunklets of frozen paste that you can drop out uh, as as you need. Um, we keep ours in uh, uh, old plastic um, vials in the fridge, dated, labeled, or whatever um, whatever uh, space is necessary, so that way you can keep your fridge nice and tidy. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. I probably added the salt. Um, that's probably why I'm smashing so much. I'm getting excited. Nope. Nope. Here, there's a the salt. Okay. See how wet it's getting. Yeah. Squishy. Yeah. So the salt's going to help it get even uh, more wet and pasty. It's really going to draw the, the, the liquid out, um, uh, even though we've already got the liquid even more. You know, we've already squeezed, smashed a lot of the liquid out of the cells. And remember, in that liquid, that's where all the flavor is. Um, cool thing about it, too. So with the smoking process, uh, if you go to, I think it's a made turmeric. There we go. Powder. And then we're done smashing. We're just going to mix it in and we'll have uh, the lovely yellow, lovely yellow paste uh, that we saw. Um, yeah, super, super efficient. It's satisfying. That's I got silent for you. It's like, come on, fill content. Uh, but we can see as we're starting to push it out, it's got a really nice, smooth, 
wet consistency with a few little chunks in there. Um, nice, very nice product. All right, that's done. So, do we have a finishing shot? Do we do we scoop it up? I forgot. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and the camera. Hashtag white balance. Bloop. There we go. Thin. Yum. But that's just the fuel. <laughs> well, wow, that was a terrible typo. Yeah. <laughs> why are you? Why are you talking about? <laughs> I, 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 I thumb swiped sneak. I didn't proofread. <laughs> that makes no, no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. And uh, I don't know. Maybe that I looks. I do want to have Tola over and eat the rest. I of don't. Uh, no, I want to sneak over and eat the rest. Oh, yeah, I do want to. I want to. <laughs> I don't want to hurry up with this, but I do want to eat the rest of it. So, <laughs> application. Um, no, I mean, I was going to sneak over eat all of it while you're stuck here. Oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, the application. The the roasted pork loin. Um, you can apply it to any sort of meat, like like we said. And, and there's so many more ways you can do. But we'll, we'll break down this specific pork loin. So, you're like, mm, maybe I can make that. Um... So salted at 0.75% uh, percent, uh, by weight. So uh, let's say this thing weighed 2,000 um, 2, grams. So 10% is 200 grams, 1% is 20 grams, and then 75% of that would be 15 grams. Um, so approximately 15 grams of salt. Uh, it kind of sounds like a lot, but at the same point, that's all the salt that's going not just on the surface of the meat, but it actually dissolves and goes inside the meat and um, makes it taste better and improves the texture in a variety of ways, both known and speculated. Um, sous vide. So we used an immersion cooker uh, at 130 degrees for uh, four to six hours. Uh, if I'm going to finish it on the grill, I like cooking uh, the meat a little bit under. Um, so pork normally you can finish now at 140 to 145 degrees. Uh, initially it was 160 to 165 degrees, which is okay for uh, fattier cuts that have got a lot of connective tissue that need to break down. So like your pork shoulder and your pork ribs, uh, things like that. Pork loin is a relatively um, lean sort of meat. Uh, and um, uh, it ends up with like pork chops and stuff. And so you can really, like it's really easy to like overcook the hell out of it. Um, and so we, we we prefer cooking it more like a, like a, like a roast where you're just getting it to doneness on the inside like a like a tri tip or even to some extent like uh, like steaks. But because it is pork and you do have that wider range to work with it from maybe 140 degrees to I guess you could cook the hell out of this to 205 degrees. It would certainly fall apart. It'd be fairly dry. Um, but all that collagen would be turned to a, turned to gelatin and it would just flake and you might actually get it to, to pull a little bit. Uh, but the point is because it's pork, it has a wide variety of tolerances and a wide variety of donenesses and a lot of versatility, uh, you can do with it. Um, has a very nice meaty sort of flavor, um, and has been, um, a very good addition to the hypocaloric and standard sort of diet foods that we've been eating. Uh, I want to emphasize that this is totally, um, this is totally diet food as we'll get down to the, the specs on it. Um, we smoked it on the, uh, uh, shopping cart, uh, smoker that, that we've made and rigged together. Uh, we don't have a thermometer on it, but it, based upon how low and slow it cooked, probably 225 degrees, uh, you could cook it in an oven if you don't have sous vide and you don't have a smoker or a grill. You can roast it in the oven at 225 degrees uh, for a very long time and just temp it to get the doneness up. And then either 325 to uh, uh, bake and caramelize the crust on it. Or if you just want to cook it to done this straight away and don't really care what the, the texture on the inside is, uh, 325, 350 for 
uh, I would suspect 35 to 45 minutes um, bake with the paste on it uh, and we'll get you something that's definitely cooked on the inside uh, and will taste very good as the texture gonna be the most optimum uh, it's difficult to say um, and so for uh, this pork log, so okay, so 1,700 grams, so 3.3 3, uh, 3 pounds approximately. Um, and this thing used 40 grams of, of paste on it, so a third of that recipe that, that we made. So in order to flavor this, it took essentially three minutes to make the flavor for that, well, to pocket. I mean, there's the... I mean, I had to do the work finding the recipe and wait, but now you can just weigh it so um lean um pork kind of got uh it used to get a bad rap and then it was the other other white meat and it kind of got a bad rap with the cholesterol and the fat and stuff and um there are certain cuts that are more conducive and less conducive to to, to weight loss and sticking to the diet and, and a lot of that will depend upon whether you're in maintenance or whether you're in a caloric deficit or or whatever um uh, 23 grams of protein versus 5 grams of fat approximately to 100 grams of total raw product. Uh, f you know, almost 5 to 1 is a very, very good ratio of protein to fat. Uh, seafood, shrimp, um, chicken breast. Uh, I think maybe London broil might be up there, but uh, uh, no. No, London broil isn't even that lean. Um, so, <clears throat> good lean product. Um, it's easy to, whatever your macronutrient composition, uh, uh, is whether you're doing like high carb or high carb, low fat or low carb, um, high fat. Wait, did I, the, the inverse of the one, um, it's, it's easy to make your macros and then still have, uh, plenty of room to either add in a little bit more fat or get in all your carbs. Um, for, for any size individual, whether you're, uh, very large or on the, uh, on the smaller side. Uh, so I said variety of Dennis's, uh, lots of options when the pork is done itself. Uh, you can put it, chop it up in stews. It's already ready to go and you just have to heat it up again. Soup, same sort of thing. A lot of great smoky flavor, uh, sandwiches sliced up, piled high. Um, it's the yellow paste. So you're Tacos, burritos, tortas, tamales, any sort of um, Hispanic dish that, that you can think of. Or you could just uh, do it as a, a standalone side. So the, the traditional um, meat, veggies, and starch uh, uh, kind of uh, entree-style meal. You can just have it sliced thin and then have your um, whatever you need in order to fit your uh, caloric goals and your macronutrient goals for the day. So... Um, if you're able to have more rice or more potatoes or more starch, then you can add more. Uh, if you need more fat, you can add more. If you need less, uh, 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 whatever. Um, videos. So this was after 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, first check. Yeah, this is the first check, even at like 10 or 15 minutes. So this is with 15 coals, and we dumped... Um, volumetrically about two cups of wood okay so boop pause right there so we'll, we'll blow this up yellow paste all up in it that right there that um orange color uh, or brown color is uh the area in between the uh grates where the smoke is coming up to start to form the uh, uh pellicle uh, we put the fat side down because the temperature is so low and we know that most of the caramelization is coming from the heat first as opposed to it um, um, in other smokers where the temperature is more controlled. Uh, the top part is getting the pellicle and there's enough heat where it'll actually cook from the top down. Here, uh, we don't have that same sort of consistent kind of, of, of heat and more regular control of it. So we use the, the heat from the bottom to help caramelize uh, the, and cause the Maillard reactions to, to occur. Um, and we'll see on the second uh, video how that, uh, how that kind of shapes up. Um, that's much better. Wigglin' and a jigglin'. 
So you can see still little chunks of onion and garlic and black pepper and stuff. Um, so coarse, but not so coarse. Good coverage everywhere. I'm going to save you for later. Ooh. So this was at the three hour mark, I think. Yeah. Three? I thought we had the thing so, somewhere, like five or six. No, it wasn't. Definitely wasn't five. It's somewhere between. I mean, we pulled it at like the five or six hour. I don't know. I think this is closer to like three or four hours. Um, okay. All right. Let's. <laughs> so that's amazing. All the little crusty black bits. Nice mahogany color from the smoke. Fat. Good color on the fat. We can see, so droplets here and here, and this stuff here is the um, interstitial fluid and, and, and plasma uh, leaking out from, from the cells. So if you've ever cooked a burger and there's that um, uh, squishy meat um, protein on, on top that kind of looks like a, 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 a puddle, um, or when you boil chicken or make stock, the scum that's at the top, that's kind of what um, some of that stuff is as it's leaking out. But other stuff right here is all the um, garlic, the sugar in it, it's caramelized. And right there, that is the meat juice and the garlic and the sugars in it coming together to make these lovely, sugary, caramelized, delicious wonderful wonderful strands of, of of porky goodness and that right there when i turn that over that's that's awesome nary nary a piece of sugar that we actually added to it yet we get that sort of sugary tenderness or uh, sugary tendrils rather from uh from the sugar inside the, the the garlic and the onions so we're nearing the end of this odyssey we're going to turn it up let me pause it Pause it. Okay. So. <clears throat> Are we good? We got. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, we'll run it back from the beginning because there's an audible. Um, oh. Okay. Okay. I gotta turn. Uh. Right here? Is that going to be good? Sure. You don't know. What? <laughs> it's a... Okay. Um, I'll, I'll let you okay. have the mouse for a... Okay. Oh, wait. Can we... Can... Wait, wait, hold up real fast. Wait, no, 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 look. Doesn't that look like a person right there? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, okay, all right. So, first play, we got the sound. Now, nice. We're digging that. Oh, okay, now I can kind of hear it a little bit. Hopefully you folks can hear it. So what is that crunching sound? That crunchy sound is that wonderful, wonderful pellicle, the rind that was formed on the outside of the meat from smoking. Meat plastic. Meat plastic. It's a polymer. Um, you know, if you get like turkey ham or regular ham or smoked gouda or whatever from a, a store and it has that brown kind of rind on the outside, well, that's what that is. It's from smoke. It is different than um, it is different from a crust that you get from searing or with an herb crust. Um, when you're searing, you're browning and you're charring. This isn't this isn't char. This is an accumulation of smoke over time, uh, doing science and making meat plastic. Um, so just want to show that off. Uh, meat is super pink and tender and very tasty. And you can see that um, we caught it just right. 
at the right temperature. If, if it was uh, already 140, 150 degrees from the sous vide when I put it on there, um, by the time it was done, uh, it would probably be all like gray or white and dry and gnarly. And then I would have been mm, single tier. It still would have been good. Um, but this is diet food. I cannot stress this enough. This is diet food. We've been eating this on, on my mesocycle. I'm down, I don't know, 11 pounds-ish or somewhere between 11 to 15 pounds-ish or something like that. Um, it's lean. So uh, why do I need to go to a restaurant? <laughs> it's so difficult. And uh, uh, Oh, I forgot to put the price. Uh, at least out here in the L.A. area from uh, Farmer John's, this is two forty nine a pound all day. At, uh, at Smart and Final, which is very cheaper than beef, uh, cheaper than Foster Farms boneless, skinless chicken breast, um, more forgiving because of how large it is, uh, better taste, more versatile, doesn't dry out. Um, I, I, I've really been uh, enjoying using this to, 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 to vary up the diet. And it's banned in all the religions of Abraham. <laughs> Hey, yes, it's well. <laughs> that's that's why that that's why that's why we are an uh, an unorthodox Jew, um, or the uh, uh, otherwise from the Daily Show, the only on uh, the uh, the only on Saturdays porkatorium. Yes, I recommend the pork. <laughs> um, okay, so I've talked about the versatility. Uh, it's more about the versatility, like specific. You can use it as a base for soup. So if you already have your soup broth, or even if you just have water, get it going, brown it a little bit, or put it in like slightly raw, add your broth, cook it up, and lots of flavor, low calorie, a little bit of salt. So then you can salt everything to taste. Uh, you can make flavored oil with it. So you could get a... Um, um, a cup maybe two cups or something like that and a teaspoon to a tablespoon uh, of it and um, fry it up in uh, in the oil and strain it uh, the bits if you don't bri uh, if you don't burn them you can use those little brown chewy bits and I don't know put them on your eggs or put them on some sort of crust or something like that um, um, bread, cheese, what you know, whatever, and then the oil you can drizzle on your bread, drizzle on your salads, make mayo out of it, uh, baste it on your meats, um, put it in your green smoothies, uh, stick it up your nose. <laughs> um, fla flavored oil, fun. Uh, um, you could make, you could even make a gel with it or freeze it or whatever. Um, you freeze it with the uh, the the liquid nitrogen. Um, the paste itself, you can actually have a lot of fun and cook it down. So it's really green. It's really raw. It's got a lot of water in it. But you saw how those caramel, uh, how, how the, the the garlic made those nice strandy uh, bits from all the sugar and, and especially the onion too. That's got a lot of carbohydrates in it. So a little bit of oil, uh, a low heat, um, you or medium heat, and you can kind of brown it and caramelize it, and then use that as your soup base or purees or a spread or something like that um or you could do it really low on a dry heat um uh, i mean uh, on a really low heat on a dry surface without any oil for preferably non-stick and um you just work it for maybe an hour or so and break up the little bits and keep working it and uh, you end up making uh, your own dehydrated or granulated onion garlic powder food herb paste blend that you can then uh, dry season meats or put it on in with a barbecue sauce or sprinkle stuff on your soups or set whatever um, uh, it's this again this paste is a gift that keeps on giving you can even put it inside the meat so if you want to do like a porchetta like a like a rolled pork belly or you want to do um <clears throat> i don't know uh, uh stuff it as uh, a butterfly chicken breast open and do do it that way uh you can put it underneath the skin up in the carcass um it's great it's so versatile 
it's this is, I don't know, the third or fourth batch we've made of it. So right here, again, showing off all the sticky little garlicky bits and that nice rind on the outside. Um, that, um, and instead of, <laughs> woo! And instead of taking uh, 12 hours to cook uh, on a smoker by getting ahead of it with the sous vide, um, that's four or six hours where we didn't have to watch it. Uh, you could get that going and you could probably even let it go for like six or eight hours if you're at work or something like that. And then at 130 degrees, uh, to finish it in the oven at 350 wouldn't take more than 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, uh, we also have another one that we didn't season where I've been, um, slicing off and been using for stir fries or dropping in soup and it's ready instantaneously there. So making these large batches of pre-cooked meat, uh, uh, either fully cooked or mostly cooked is, uh, uh, of good lean meat is a real easy way for you to be able to stay ahead, uh, um, adhere to a diet and then get ahead of it. Uh, when we're hungry, especially when we're deep in a deficit, the last thing we want to be doing is, and we still get in this position all the time, is like, God, I'm hungry. I need to eat something. I need protein and food. And, and you know, by planning ahead of time, even if it's just, okay, fine, I'm going to uh, go go raw and just cop like 130 and then shove it in my mouth and and, and and be done with it and get my protein in me. Well, at least it's good protein. Um, but then you have all this, this fantastic meat to mix with all your veggies. And oh my God, I, I didn't even say it. Tofu and putting it on top of roast veggies and mixing it with uh, uh, beans and, and all sorts of vegetarian options. Anything grilled, any kebab, anything like that. Um, it, uh, um, it, it goes really, really well. And we can modify the paste. And this will be the last slide. Um, for more, I guess it would be Mediterranean or, or, or Middle East or, or Greek or something like that. Some lemon juice or some lemon zest, some coriander seeds, uh, um, uh, Indian food. Um, it's very, uh, I suspect it'd be very similar to that, um, green uh dipping sauce that you get with um uh i was gonna say pupusas but samosas um pupusas is uh the the salvadorian um fried bready pocket of awesomeness versus the samosa is the uh, indian fried bready doughy pocket of awesomeness um but you can make it comes with this lovely like bright fresh cilantro green sauce and so you can make something uh, similar to that uh, more, I don't know, what would you say, uh, like, te like Tex-Mex? Yeah. Or Southwest with the red chili flakes or the paprika? Uh, you could even go with smoked paprika if you wanted to add a little bit of flavor to it. Um, you can see here on this side where some of the yellow of the turmeric kind of comes through, but really when it gets, like, deep sort of smoke, it becomes more auburn and, and, and mahogany kind of colored um, but if you're just grilling something straight away uh, that yellow color uh, like a pollo asado the yellow color gets really really well preserved um, or for Italian you can just swap out the turmeric and maybe the cilantro for a couple of things oh yeah yeah so um, uh, uh, pesto is derived from pestle it is made with the smashy smashy. Oh, and goodness, let's say you're one of those uh, unfortunate individuals that's a, that's a mutant and, and the cilantro tastes like dirt or dish soap or something like that. Feel free to use whatever sort of other green herb that you want to use. Uh, parsley stems or mint stems or basil stems or... Um, <clears throat> Even if you're not alert and you want to experiment or something like that, go you know go nuts. Uh, uh, the the mint would definitely uh, uh, reminds me of a uh, very like uh, Greek and I think lamb, um, uh, a nice roasted lamb shank in particular would be very very tasty. Or uh, if you're um, again on the on the vegetarian sort of tip, uh, tofu with the mint or tofu with the the, the parsley or something like that, um, uh, very very. Uh, uh, flavorful to be sure especially because of how the tofu really absorbs like just whatever flavor that it's around um let's see ah now we're getting into the steez okay so 
Um, if you want to use the puck, and I mean really use the puck, and you want to get after a Thai curry paste, I mean really get after a Thai curry paste, like a northern Thai curry paste, like the ones that you find out of uh, Andy uh, Andy Ricker's uh, Pock Pock book. Um, the, uh, what is it? It's the fish balls with green curry and rice vermicelli noodles. <sighs> That's tasty. Um, Golongol. It's, uh, like ginger. If you can't get Golongol, don't use ginger. Just, just don't. Just stop. Just stop. <laughs> um, lemongrass, Thai chilies, either red or fresh green, either red dried or fresh green ones. Uh, shrimp paste. Um, it stinks. It's shrimpy and awesome, but it's the salty funkiness that makes um, makes the Thai curry paste complete. And then the mock root lime peel, uh, not the leaves. I guess you could use the leaves if you had to. Um, but if if you were stuck using, I guess regular lime peel versus mock root lime leaves, uh, just go with the regular lime peel. Uh, I think would be better served. Um, and anyway, you pack all that stuff together with what you already have because, um, so it, it, it calls for the, like I said, the cilantro stems, well, or uh, cilantro roots. Well, it has stems in it and it's got the garlic and it's got onions instead of shallots. It's really, really close and you're most of the way there. Uh, again, on that Southeast Asian tip, so saute or, um, it goes by a variety of names in uh, Indonesia, uh, but the, the peanut butter dipping sauce. So with the paste, you could go with the peanut butter, coconut cream, again, some more lemongrass, some fish sauce, maybe some sugar to taste. And, and you've got the, the saute dipping sauce, or you could use that as a, something to, to, to rub on top of the meat while it's um, uh, grilling. Uh, be careful, though. With this one, this is high calorie. Or higher calorie because of the peanut butter and the coconut uh, cream in it. So unlike uh, the the other paste and stuff that you're smearing on, if you're actually using this as like an eating sort of condiment, be careful. It, with all that fat, it'll rack up pretty quickly. I think a tablespoon of oil is 115 calories. So um, you know, is, is, is maybe uh, five five to ten five percent of someone's daily calories maybe per tablespoon. So. Um, then barbecue sauce. You could go a couple different ways uh, with it. You could go with like a kind of a twist maybe on a, a Carolina style pulled pork. Uh, I, I guess that's what we we're thinking because of all this pork loin. Uh, for the pulled pork, you would use shoulder. You would not use loin. You would use shoulder because of the extra fat and connective tissue that <coughs> um, is necessary for um, pork shoulder to be awesome. And uh pulled pork to be awesome you need the fat and, and anyway and you can cook the hell out of it so it gets super tender um mustard sugar vinegar to taste uh should be fairly acidic and uh fairly sweet and then when you have all those herbs in there especially the yellow in there will will go really nicely with the mustard too so it'll help reinforce it or if you want to do a, a traditional um i don't know traditional whatever uh, uh a standard ketchup based or tomato based uh barbecue sauce uh carte blanche uh ketchup brown sugar maybe some white sugar and and whatever sort of magic you want to throw in there uh more salt more pepper more cayenne more paprika um liquid smoke uh worcestershire molasses um a1 coca-cola um palm sugar uh what whatever and, and you know what whatever magic that goes into your blend of barbecue sauce or if you want to mess around you've got a lot of the herbs and the flavor already um already in that paste uh and and i suspect that it also make because it's like slightly chucky again you'll get if you paint it on you'll get some of those uh, uh some of those strandies like, like like we had when we turned it over from all the sugar and the the garlic from the from the smoking and i imagine that would be uh very very fantastic so, goodness, that, no more clicking, that's it. So we can go exit, right? Yep. You're going to switch me over to, um, yep. to, uh, to this view here. Are we good? Yep, you're there. All right. So, um... Anybody have any questions? We're going over the feed. Yes, the oh yeah. Um, well, not so much. You uh, 
No questions. You you covered things pretty well there. Uh, I covered things far more than they need to be covered. Um, so the we definitely covered all the. What are we? Where are we doing this? Continue. Just continue. Yeah. Okay. So um, the lecture slides will be posted uh, on the website fitnessforcoolpeople.com in media. Is that medium uh, broadcast? Yeah. Yeah. So in the medium broadcast or yeah, uh, the media section, you can click on broadcast, and we'll have the uh, slides up there. Uh, you'll be able to see the other lecture we had uh, earlier from the um, sports science and um, uh, nutrition show uh, and awesome show. It's amazing. All the shows are amazing. You're missing out if you're not watching. Probably. Um, I'm rambling. We're going to wrap this up. Uh, my name's Eli Holland. Yeah. Thanks so much for uh, watching. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can hit me up uh, on Instagram at uh, Fitness for Cool People, um, Facebook at Fitness for Cool People, Twitch, also surprisingly at Fitness for Cool People, Twitter, Fit for Cool, Fit for with the number uh, for cool people.com, not dot com. Shit, we're tired. Are we <laughs> do we do we have any? Are we are we good? Um, okay, so. Um, all right, what do we, oh, here's it. Dirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that. That, that cutting did not go well. No, that's what happens when your knife isn't sharp. Uh, you get a blooper. So, and thanks, uh, everybody for watching, and, uh, we will be in touch. Oh, next show is, uh, 8 p.m. on Thursday. I'm either going to be um, debuting and demoing the uh, weight loss template that will be available uh, for purchase um, using the uh, phasic method that we talked about in the, um, uh, the first lecture last Thursday. Uh, it'll either be that or um, I think I might want to talk about uh, strength training and exercise volume. Um, next Sunday, uh, we are going to be doing a lecture on the Filipino Tamarind Soup Synagogue, and it is going to be highlighting, I think, some cutting techniques, uh, how to uh, work with some vegetables and make a quick soup, and um, how to puree uh, tamarind paste and the versatility of tamarind. So stay tuned for that. That'll be very tasty. Very healthy soup, too. So uh, we're done. Take care. There you go. Are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna cut back to um? Uh, cut, cut, cut back to a reaction from us or something like that? No, it's just gonna. It's got the offline screen, so it's gonna transition to offline. Mm, okay. What was that? Sorry. 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 Sorry.